Okay, so hello everybody. Uh, it is a pleasure to, to have with us today, Professor Carlos Duarte, who is now is currently a distinguished professor at the Kin Abdullah University of Science and Technology in South, Saudi Arabia. And uh, well, Professor Duarte is a, is a very good friend of some of us, or some of us now him some, some, some time ago. But for those that don't know him, I, I will summarize uh, a little bit uh, his career. But of course, I, I should be should refrain because just summarizing the, his career will will I will I will take all the hour of, uh, of the seminar. So I will try to be short. Um, to be short, the, uh, Carlos Duarte uh, graduated from from the Autonomous University of Madrid in Spain. And then he obtained a PhD in Limnology in McGill University in Montreal, Canada, which was in 1987. And then he, he returned back to, to Spain, to the Institute of Ciencias del Mar, and then to the, the, to the positions in the Spanish National Research Council, in particular to the Center of uh, Advanced Studies in Blanes. Uh, and then in 2000, uh, sorry, in 1000, um, in 1999, he moved to, to Imedea, to the other research, specific research institute in the Bayari Canyons, where he, he was a research professor until 2015. And we, we started successful collaborations with him. Some of us had collaborations with him at that, at that time. In 2015, he, he moved to, to the University of Western uh, Western Australia, and, and after, after this, he, he joined the, the staff of the, the, the Environmental Science and Engineering Division of the Red Sea Research Center at the Kina Abdullah University of Science and Technology. And, and he, he was appointed later director of the Red Sea Research Center. And also, he joined the Computational Biology Research Center in 2017. Okay, so this is the um, his research, he started as an ethnologist, so he studied in, in biology of fresh water, but then he, he was opening, opening uh, the view, and finally he's, he's well known by, by lots of, by words on the, the role of the, of the ecosystems on, on biota in the carbon cycling, in the regulation of, uh, of, of climate, in the, so in all the interactions concerning our planet, planet Earth. And he also, he, he developed, he was responsible for developing some blue, blue carbon strategies to mitigate, to mitigate uh, climate change. An important point, in this one important achievement was that he led the Malaspina Circum Navigation Expedition that was in, in 2010 and 2011. This, this expedition was, uh, was going around the, the world seas, uh, collecting data and, and obtaining data on the biodiversity of the, the global Global ocean. Um, so, so um, uh, just listing the, 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 the honors and the prizes he has got is maybe too long, but I will just mention a few of them. Yes, he was elected president of the American Society of Limnology and Oceanography. He received the Evelyn Hutchinson Award from the American Society of Limnology and Oceanography in 2001, the Spanish National uh, Research Science in Natural Resources in 2007. Uh, the Carlo Hay International Award for Accomplishments in Marine Biodiversity from the World Marine Biodiversity Conference in, in Montreal in 2018, the Ramon Margalet Prize in Ecology in 2019, and last year the BBDR Foundation from Tires in Knowledge Awards in the area of ecology and conservation biology. This is just a summary of, of uh, achievements, but uh, uh, his I can tell you that uh, he's a really a, uh, he's really he's really a scientist. So it's, it's a pleasure to talk with him about science, do any science. And I think that uh, today he will he will give us some some talk on some some different ecologies. So let's see what happens. But I am sure it will be interesting. The, the topic of today is rapid evolution of, of um, SARS-CoV-2 challenges, human defenses. So let's see, Carlos, the, you can share your screen and welcome. Bye. Thank you very much, Emilio, for the introduction. I hope that everybody can hear me well and you can see my screen. 
So uh, beyond uh, thanking Emilio for the kind introduction, then I would also like to thank IFISC for hosting me on a sabbatical. It's not that hard because it's mostly a remote sabbatical, but we are working and starting new exciting projects. So I'm very happy to uh, start new work with my colleagues at IFISC. And in fact, the seminar that I will be giving today is actually about work uh, that is about to be uh, submitted uh, in collaboration with two uh, members of IFISC, uh, Victor Aguiluz and Juan Fernandez uh, Gracia. And it is about ecology, but it's about the ecology of interactions between human and a pathogen that uh, we all uh, have become very aware of called uh, SARS-CoV-2, uh, responsible for the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, I will be talking about rapid evolution of SARS-CoV-2 uh, challenges, human defenses, and then my co-authors, in addition to uh, Victor and Juan, are David, David Ketachon, who's a professor on applied mathematics at KAUST, uh, Susana Agusti, who's also a professor of marine uh, uh, sciences at KAUST and works on, uh, on virus and uh, in plankton communities, but she works on interactions between pathogenic viruses and hosts. Then Tahira Hamil is a, an ecological statistician also at KAUST, Elisa Layolo, is a student working on uh, metagenomics. Takashi Gohobor is a distinguished professor working on functional genomics and Inti Havalam is a bioinformatician working at Cal. <clears throat> uh, yeah. So uh, be before I move into that, uh, maybe for those who might be interested, some details on uh, my sabbatical at Cal, which is a, a sabbatical with a mask, a very kind of different uh, kind of sabbatical, but we did not want to uh, postpone the sabbatical. And uh, so we are here in Mallorca working with colleagues at IFISC. And then uh, our work at IFISC involves uh, con contributing to understanding seagrass landscape dynamics uh, with uh, work involving Emilio, Damia, uh, Manuel, uh, Tomas, and uh, Alex and many others. And that's work that we started a long time ago, and uh, there has been a lot of progress on this uh, on this uh, area of research. And I hope to also contribute and catch up with the newest uh, developments. And then building on that work, then uh, I would like, uh, and then we are starting to work on understanding landscape patterns, uh, formation and dynamics in coral reefs. I do a work now, a lot of work now on coral reefs, and I thought that many of the concepts and models that we develop for uh, seagrasses can actually be used to understand uh, at a different maybe time scale landscape uh, patterns and dynamics for coral reefs. Then uh, we're also working on examining global networks of uh, prokaryotic microbiomes in the ocean based on uh, metagenomic data from the Malaspina expedition and a sister expedition called the Tara expedition. So those are massive global data. And then also uh, we are finishing up work that we initiated long ago in 2013, of which we've published already a joint paper. But uh, this time we are looking at uh, interrogating uh, global uh, automatic identification data of a uh, ship movement to identify patterns of probably legal uh, behavior of vessels across the global ocean. So we're hoping to uh, make progress in all of those four areas. But actually, yesterday I was tweeting about what I'm, I'm actually doing on my sabbatical. So it's a broader context. So I have to finish one book by September, and I'm well advanced into doing that. And I need to make progress on two other books that I'm writing. I need I have a, a, a lot of papers to work on, but three major papers that I need to write uh, during the sabbatical. And then uh, uh, the sabbatical program includes a component in Norway that is Initially, it should have been in May, but now we're still close due to the uh, uh, COVID pandemic. So now it's at the end of the of the sabbatical around September, hope, hoping that it will be possible to travel there to develop new sustainable foods for humans and animals from, from the ocean. Uh, then, as I mentioned, understanding coral landscape formation. But I, I would also like to take these six months to re-energize my research and uh, re-engineer my team for a... Uh, perhaps my, the last lap of, of my career as a, as a scientist, and then obviously have lots of fun and then leave some toxic academic uh, interaction behind. So really work with uh, very close colleagues and friends as uh, 
as those of you in EFIS are. I always enjoyed working with you and those are the type of very healthy, but also productive and fun scientific interactions that I enjoyed. And I hope to have lots of that. <clears throat> so uh, the framework or the base for uh, the work that I will present today is a work that I initiated at KAUST when I moved there in 2015. So KAUST has a, a, a supercomputer uh, called Sahin. In fact, the one in the photograph is uh, the first Sahin. Now we are on the second Sahin, and this one is already commissioned. But Sahin is one of the uh, most powerful supercomputers in the world. When it was installed uh, three years ago, it was ranked at the seventh most powerful supercomputer in the world. But uh, unlike uh, the other uh, supercomputers in the list of top 10, Sahin has a very small uh, number of users. So all of the others are used by very large uh, 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 consortia of scientists, uh, thousands of scientists and also corporations and government and so on. Shaheen is only used for maybe 30 uh, academics and turns out that I am uh, the second largest user of Shaheen. But it's really a, a very powerful machine. And then uh, we develop a system to start to assemble a program on the global ocean genome where we have brought uh, to Shaheen all of the data on ocean genomics that is available from our own expeditions, but also from other projects. And in fact, we have broadened the scope of the project to uh, the global uh, genome of biosphere. So now it's no longer no longer only the ocean, but the whole biosphere. And we are basically assembling a large data sets on metagenomics. Uh, now we have about 30,000 meta metagenomic samples. And our last edition of the gene catalog contained in the, in the biosphere is 1.5 billion genes that we have already cataloged and we have assigned function to about 80% of those. So now we're busy exploring the architecture of the genome of the biosphere and also looking at metabolic networks. Every one of you is invited to join us. And in fact, we have a program to invite collaborators to work with us on this program. All you need to do if you're interested then I can give you uh, some material so you learn more about the program. But uh, basically, you need to send me an expression of interest of what question would you like to address to make sure that we are not duplicating efforts. And then uh, we uh, open access to uh, this resource and also to the supercomputer for your, for your uh, questions. So uh, what we did also is not only uh, uh, use the brute force of uh, Shaheen, but uh, in addition to the Red Research Center, I'm also a member of the Computational Biology Research Center, which is a center where we use big data, artificial intelligence, and uh, text mining, and other techniques, uh, big data techniques, to be able to make sense of very large uh, data sets on biology that are emerging in the, in the age of, uh, of genomics. So we are combining uh, the brute force of Sahin with algorithms and platforms for the exploration of massive genotic, genomic data sets. And then uh, what we have done uh, since the COVID uh, pandemic uh, started, and actually my interest in COVID started in the uh, uh, 15th of January when my colleague Intihab, uh, a bioinformatician that is a co-author in this work, came to my office and asked me if I was following the news about this new virus from China. And at that time, that was 15th of January, of uh, 2020, he told me that there were some estimates that there could be as much as many as 50 million people infected globally, and probably around uh, 100,000 people uh, died. At that time, I thought that was impossible, and then th those were really exaggerated projections. I think we already exceeded those numbers before the end of last year, and the total number of infected people and the total number of uh, Disease people due to COVID is unfortunately much, much larger than the numbers that uh, Intihab uh, shared then, which seemed really impossible. But what we did, what we did is to repurpose uh, our platform for genomic analysis to be able to analyze uh, online uh, COVID data or SARS-CoV-2 uh, data or genomics of the virus. And in fact, we have published already a number of papers, but then we also realized that the a uh, real-time tracking of the genomic evolution of the virus was a unique opportunity to test evolutionary theory that had actually never been uh, tested and was largely inferential in nature. 
So uh, at CBRC, we developed this uh, tool that is a COVID-19 virus mutation tracker where we are assimilating in real time data from around the world on genomic sequencing of SARS. And then we are uh, analyzing the data to identify mutations, variants, and track uh, the, the landscape of mutations across the genome of the, of the virus that has about 38,000 uh, base pairs, uh, pairs of uh, bases. So uh, we had this resource, which we published in The Lancet uh, last year, and it's open to anybody to use and download data from this resource. But then we use the, uh, a platform called uh, a King Abdullah uh, Metagenomic Analysis Platform to analyze this uh, genome data and then make inferences about the evolution and mutations of the virus. And then uh, we have used this opportunity to test uh, specifically three uh, laws or uh, theories in evolutionary ecology that remain inferential up to date because we never had the data to test them. Now we do with COVID. One of them is called the red queen theory. And the red queen theory is a metaphor of the evolutionary race between mm -hmm. pathogens and hosts. And the allusion to the red queen theory comes because in the book of the Behind the Mirror, of uh, Alice uh, by Lewis Carroll. Uh, then uh, he wrote uh, that the queen, the red queen says that in my kingdom, it takes all of the running you can do to keep in the same place. And if you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast as that. So that means that uh, you, we need to be constantly cha uh, changing to keep in place. And that alludes to the evolutionary race between pathogens and hosts. And in fact, the Red Queen theory is uh, probably the prevalent explanation for the evolution of sex, which is a way by which uh, organisms are able to reshuffle uh, very rapidly their genome every generation to be able to uh, generate new genomic variability and be able to overtake the very, the very fast evolutionary rates of uh, pathogens that usually have a much uh, shorter and quicker life cycle than the host. And therefore, they can, uh, I, in principle, then uh, change and mutate rap more rapidly than the host can defend itself. So uh, we're going to try to challenge uh, the, the red queen theory with uh, COVID data. And then there is another uh, area in which uh, Emilio, Victor, and uh, myself work on, in the, and Claudio Tessone work on in the past with a former PhD student in the IFIS called Alejandro Herrada which was uh, to look at laws of universal sca scaling in the branching of the tree of life. So those are uh, laws looking at the size of branches or the weight of branches versus the depth of branches in, uh, in trees. And we found that these laws actually are conserved uh, within phylogenies of uh, uh, protein families, but also even when we look uh, broadly at the um, at the tree of life, and even when we look at phylogenies of extinct, extinct uh, uh, taxa and uh, organisms. But of course, uh, what uh, processes lead to these uh, exponents, uh, then we could only infer, and now we can see uh, uh, if uh, the evolution of COVID is leading to new uh, variants uh, following this law and the phylogenetic tree, of COVID follows these laws, and then we will know uh, what are actually the processes leading to these uh, to these scalings that we uh, could only uh, postulate uh, at the time. This is another uh, another uh, expression of that law. In this case, we're looking at the degree distribution in the whole tree of life, and look at the, a power law with a spawning of 2.2 between the degree distribution of different uh, branch sizes. And the uh, and the abundance of taxa within the within the branches, and then there's a related law uh, of which I was able to which I was able to discuss at a a, a previous seminar and a conference in if it organized by Fisk where I was invited, I believe two years ago, maybe three years now. Which is called the uh, new uh, law, and this is a relationship between the number of species in a particular genus and the number of uh, sorry, number of species in a particular taxa 
and the number of genera, genera in that uh, taxa. So this is actually a very old law from 1922, and it has been rediscovered in many, many ways, but it does have an evolutionary explanation, but the, again, the evolutionary explanation that of the process that gives uh, rise to this law, again, remains inferential and has never been tested. So uh, this is a, a power law that results from a double exponential process where the growth of species in terms of number of individuals affect the likelihood of a new species appearance. And therefore, older taxa would have diversified more than younger ones. And then a species more widely distributed with more uh, abundant would have yield more variants. So we're testing this with COVID, but of course is not a cross species, but we're testing that in terms of the uh, phylogeny and the evolution of new variants and how new variants and the branches of the phylogenetic tree of COVID-2, uh, um, of uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, is actually growing. So let me first define what are we going to uh, refer to as variants. Uh, there's a lot of discussion in the media about the COVID variants. In principle, uh, in the more, in the broader sense, a variant is a genome, uh, a genome sequence that differs in at least one uh, uh, base pair. From the, from the reference uh, genome, which is the one that was first sequenced uh, in Wuhan. Uh, but of, of course, this generates a lot of uh, variants, like millions of, of variants. And here we are narrowing down the definition uh, for operationally to focus on uh, mutations uh, that lead to unique amino acid sequences within a very small part of the genome, which is only about 180 a pair basis in size, which is called the RBD domain or the spike protein. And the reason why we focus on this uh, very small area of the genome is that this is the area that uh, is believed to be responsible for uh, entry of the virus to the human cells, and therefore is the part of the genome that controls infectivity of the, of the variants, which is what we're really interested on. And also, for instance, pathogenicity is not really well understood in terms of what elements of the features of the genome are responsible for different uh, components of uh, pathogenicity, although inflammation seems to be related to a uh, protein E, which is a part of the genome. But we are really interested in inf infectivity, which is the process that eventually leads to a rise of variants and the spread of variants, and therefore we focus only on the RBD domain. And also note that we focus only on, on amino acid sequences because they, they might be multiple uh, or different sequences of uh, bases that lead to the same amino acid sequence. So they're called synonymous. And therefore, because functionally that they are the same, we aggregate them into the same uh, variant if the resulting amino acid sequence is the same. Okay, so... Uh, uh, this is actually data that I uh, uh, just we updated today, but we haven't been able to find uh, most of the data that you will see is updated as to uh, until May 18, so just a couple of weeks before. And this is the the most recent that we can update the data because it takes about two weeks to uh, sequence the genome of uh, COVID and then uh, curate the genome and then upload the genome in the databases. So we are always a bit uh, about two weeks behind the sampling uh, of the of the virus, but basically we used a model that we published uh, last year, uh, led by David, David Kedershon, to calculate the total number of infections, uh, because we believe that the number of infections that are reported is not reliable, and uh, it is a gross underestimate of the true uh, infections because it does depend on testing and also because the uh, effort of testing and reporting differs greatly about, uh, among nations, then it's not reliable. So instead, we use the number of, uh, of uh, fatalities that are attributed to COVID-19, still an underestimate because uh, there might be many fatalities that were not recorded as being COVID-19 fatalities, but they were probably related to the virus. But in any case, if we work back from the fatalities to calculate how many people had to be infected to give those fatalities, then we get a number that is about three times larger than the number of infected people globally, and still it is an underestimate. 
So uh, we actually, the data that comes into this is not only the total number of fatalities, but also the distribution by age and uh, gender, because age and gender are uh, important elements that determine, determine the fatality of uh, people inf infected by COVID. So to back calculate how many people have to be infected to yield this number of fatalities, we need to know correct also for age and gender. So uh, basically, we uh, uh, once we have the number of fatalities, then we cal calculate uh, the total number of uh, virus produced. And then we know that there's about 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 8 uh, viruses that are produced per inf infected person per day. So if we know how many people were infected in any one day, we can, cal can calculate uh, the total number of uh, viruses that have been produced because the probability of a mutation, if it's a random process, then is, uh, is related to the number of copies that are being produced. And just as a note, uh, the mutations in uh, RNA viruses are, are actually quite high and RNA viruses are known to be very unstable in terms of your, the genome. So the g genome is very labile and changes rapidly and mutate rapidly. And there are also processes by which a, a hybrids from a, of genomic sequences can be produced when two variants co-occur in the same cell. Uh, you know that has happened already. Uh, both mutations, but in any case, is ultimately related, ultimately related to the output of uh, viruses produced. So uh, in the figure in the left, what you see is the total number of uh, variants uh, detected uh, in red and the total number of viruses that have been produced, which by now is about uh, 10 to the 21, which is as many as the number of stars that are uh, calculated that exist in the universe. So a very, very large number. And you can see a very close correspondence between the total number of uh, the total production of viruses to date, and this is cumulative numbers, and the total number of variants that have been detected. And also uh, on the figure in the right, you can see uh, we then develop a model to calculate uh, how many variants can be produced from a, as, a, as a function of the uh, number of viruses produced. And we then calculated from this model that there is a new variant produced for every 600,000 human infections. And if we look at how many uh, infections are reported every day, then we calculate that there's about three to five new variants of COVID that are produced somewhere in the world every day. So really a very large uh, growth rate of uh, variants. And uh, you can see that there's a very, very close match between the cumulative uh, number of uh, variants that we, uh, that we produce from the model, and then the entirely independent number of cumulative number of isolates that have been sequenced. So the more we sequence, the more variants we uh, encounter. And then we find that uh, on average, there is a new variant found for every 900 uh, uh, viruses that are sequenced. So this figure here shows a, a timeline of the production of new variants in, previous, uh, in the previous month. Because as I mentioned, then it takes some time to upload the data and curate the sequences. And the different codes uh, refer to different variants. And in this case, then uh, each uh, primary variant, for instance, uh, you have heard of the British variants and the South African and now the Indian uh, variant and the Brazil variant. They're actually nodes on a, on a tree, but then they continue to diversify. So the British variant now is diversified into many, many variants that have emerged from that British variant and the same for South Africa, Brazil, and other variants. So you can see that around uh, February this year, when we were in the third wave or something like that, there was a, a, a really large surge in uh, the detection of new variants because that's when uh, the global production of virus, viruses was largest in the, in the time series. So now uh, in this uh, panel, you can see on the top left, the doubling time uh, of the variant. So it's how many days it takes to double the number of variants. 
and the average is about 130 days, so which is about uh, four months. So every four months, the number of variants is doubled. So we continue to generate a huge number of variants and it's an exponential process. And then that is also seen in the figure in uh, the panel B on the top right, where each line represents the uh, contribution of each different variant uh, to the total number of genomes. Uh, there is, they're coded by density, but you can see that, but I will show you that with more detail later on. But you can see that the number of variants has accelerated greatly since uh, uh, November last year, and then we continue to grow exponentially on number of variants. Again, this data is updated until uh, May 18. And the panel C shows in a logarithmic scale the total number of RBD, RBD variants over time. So you can see that we are now have now uh, several thousand uh, variants uh, defined. And then you can see again that there's a very close correspondence between the total number of variants uh, described and the total number of genomes that have been sequenced, which is the panel D. And for each uh, um, virus that has been sequenced, we call that an isolate. So an isolate whose entire genome has been sequenced. And then on the bottom, then if we rank, uh, if we rank the number of isolates and we rank them by variants and we look at the uh, just apparato distribution or a rank abundance plot of the number of uh, variants within each uh, isolates within each variant, then we can see a U law emerging with an exponent of 1.6. So three, but it's actually the first time that a phylogenetic tree has real time uh, because the distance from the uh, uh, center of the plot represents the time, uh, uh, the time between the detection of the uh, uh, SARS virus and the time that the variant was first detected. So there is for the first time real time on an evolutionary tree. Uh, uh, in the past, there's uh, inferred time based on, on a, a gen genetic uh, clocks, but those are very unreliable, but this is really reliable time, at least to detection of the first variant. And then you can see that the whole length is one year because uh, it goes from March to May. And then you can see how uh, many of the large uh, clusters of the tree have actually formed maybe over, over the last three, four months. And the color codes uh, represent the variants that uh, you hear uh, most about in the media, which is the UK, which is the uh, green uh, uh, leaves on the tree. The uh, South African is the blue uh, leaves in the tree. The uh, Brazilian are the purple and the Indian, which is more recent is the orange, where well, you can see very few of the orange, but you can definitely see a lot of British variants, which are the green in the tree. And also you can see that the British variants have not emerged once, but they have already emerged more, more than once uh, in, the, in the tree. And in fact, there are many uh, evidences that we can discuss later about the rapid evolution of uh, COVID. Uh, and then what you see in the right is the, the scaling of the, of the tree. Uh, between the relationship between the mean depth, which is D, and the weight of the clusters of the subtrees in the evolutionary tree, and the uh, cluster of points actually fit to the square root of D. So A is then scales at the square root of D, and it is very, very similar to the uh, scaling of trees that uh, Alejandro Errada obtained in his thesis work, only that this time we do know how this uh, come about and originate. And the black uh, dotted line is what will be the expected scaling if that was a perfectly balanced tree where uh, the tree was growing symmetrically. And the green line is a perfectly imbalanced tree where it only grows in one side of the branches and consistently on that uh, side. Now I'm going to show you a movie that Juan uh, shared yesterday where you will see a uh, the number that you see is the number of isolates for each variant detected. Of course, we start with one because it is the first uh, variant detected in Wuhan that was uh, found. And then I'm going to hit the play and then you will see uh, new variants coming up 
and the counter being the total number of uh, isolates that were sequenced that happened to be on that particular RBD variants. Eventually, you will see different uh, name, names in brackets, for instance, uh, uh, G, uh, Great Britain, South Africa, Brazil, and India. And that's because those, uh, those uh, uh, variants are actually included in the same branch that, uh, that you will see growing. So I'm going to hit uh, play, and then you will see what has actually happened with the uh, uh, evolution of variants. So obviously the Wuhan uh, variant that was first detected was, we don't actually don't know that is the first one, but it's the first one that was sequenced. And Paul probably has discussed now in the media, the SARS has been there for a long time, but either in Wuhan or elsewhere, this is the first time that it became infective enough to lead to an epidemic. So this is not likely the first variant, but probably the first variant that was highly infective. So you can see that there is already a huge advantage of that variant because it's growing exponentially globally. And then the other ones, even though we start to see variants emerging in, in the UK, also in South Africa, uh, they actually are uh, available in much lower numbers than the variant that uh, was initially detected. We are now in the summer last year, and then we are entering uh, the second wave of the virus. And then you can see a South African variant then starting to grow uh, significantly, but still well behind the uh, original uh, variant sequenced in Wuhan. We see now in September the first detections of the British uh, variant that starts to uh, emerge and uh, starts to catch up with the South African uh, variant along the fall of 2020. And then we see the Brazil uh, variant emerging already around November with the onset of the summer in Brazil uh, and a, a large wave in Brazil, uh, that variant becoming very rapidly uh, prevalent and actually now overtaking the previously detected uh, UK and uh, South African variant. We see the Indian variant starting to appear in February. And look at the rapid, rapid growth of the Brazilian variant that is really rapid, so uh, growing so rapidly that is overtaking the uh, Wuhan original variant. And in fact, by the uh, mid-May, when the time series ends, then uh, most of the uh, isolates, cumulative isolates, actually are equally distributed between the Indian, uh, the original Wuhan and the Brazil variant, which means that most of, of the sequences that have been sampled over the last uh, five months have all been or mostly been to the Brazilian variant. So I think that is, a, uh, I need to uh, see how I move. Yeah, so then uh, I would like to share maybe some thoughts on uh, that are important in terms of how we defend ourselves from, uh, from this process. So this one, uh, so we have uh, confirmed the Red Queen theory in that the virus is, is uh, very rapidly evolving and ra running very fast in becoming more infective. So the selection process today uh, selects for the most infective uh, variants. Uh, evolutionary theory, there's another component of that theory called killing the winner, where uh, developed actually for plankton. So where viruses can have multiple hosts, that uh, theory uh, predicts that the evolutionary stable strategy will be to attack the host that is present in the highest availability. And guess who this is? That, that's us humans. So we know that there's at least uh, 40 species that are, can be infected by SARS, but the one that is present in a high availability and also with high mobility is us humans. So we are the winner, and therefore the evolutionary strategy of SARS is kill the winner, kill humans. And this uh, evolutionary strategy is only forced once a human hosts start to be depleted and we are no longer uh, present in massive availability, then the virus will start to change its strategy and it will start to diversify in the attack and evolution to be able to become more infective to other species like dogs and tigers and many others that have been shown to be vulnerable. But we are the winner and therefore the, the virus is attacking humans. Uh, predominantly, and I believe there's been some speculations trying to draw parallels between the Spanish flu 
of a century ago and the SARS-CoV-2 uh, pandemic. But I think there is really no precedent for that because at no time in human history, we have been available in such large availability. We are now 7.6 7 billion humans on the planet and we are globally connected across all scales from local scales to global scales. So in fact, we are a single herd. This thing of herd immunity uh, referred to a town or referred to a nation, actually I think is ludicrous because we are a single herd and we are globally connected because of our connectivity at every scale. So every variant will hit us regardless of where it has been uh, found. And the thing about Indian, uh, now today I heard about the Vietnamese variant, this is just distracting. It doesn't really matter what it was first detected. It matters how do we defend ourselves from these uh, variants. So one of the elements of defenses is to be able to detect the infective variants as soon as possible, to try to isolate it and prevent their global uh, spread. And that uh, depends, I'm sorry for the label in, in Spanish, that depends on a genomic sequencing effort. So we can only detect variants if we sequence uh, isolates, and we can only sequence if we have the resources to do it. So the global map on the top source shows the number of genomes isolate, and you can see that uh, the blue is one. You can see a lot of uh, nations in Africa and also Southeast Asia and others and even the Caribbean where there's no single genome has been uh, isolated and sequenced. And then you can see some countries like remarkably the US, but also uh, Canada, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Denmark, uh, the UK uh, has been nations with very, very significant sequencing effort. So in fact, 90% uh, of all of the sequences have been derived from samples collected in only 10 nations. Uh, that have uh, very large sequencing capabilities and they have allocated a lot of resources to sequence that. And then in the figure in the bottom, then you have the number of variants that has been detected, have been detected for uh, the first time in each, uh, in each uh, nation. And then you can see that it follows perfectly. So the more you sequence, the more variants you detect. And as I indicated earlier, for every 900 uh, genome sequence, we detect a new variant. And that means that uh, I'd like to uh, point your attention to um, maybe three nations, India, uh, Brazil, and uh, Mexico. And India and, uh, and uh, Brazil uh, are very large nations with a huge number of hundreds of millions of infected people uh, in or at least that, that scale of number in each of them but the number of variant sequence relative to the population size is very, very small. And in Mexico, there's been also a huge number of infections, but only uh, uh, less than 1,000 genomes uh, 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 sequence. And therefore, there's been, been very few variants uh, found. Because this is a random process, then we expect that there will be the same number of new variants more or less produced per the same number of infected uh, people. So we believe there is a large uh, pool of undetected variants in India, in Brazil, and in Mexico, probably in other nations, but those three in particular, we believe that there's a very large pool of undetected variants, which is a risk for everybody. And in this figure, you can see, you can read anything on the bar plot on the left, but it shows the total number of isolates uh, uh, per variant detected. So that scale per variant detected, the top nation is the UK, then is the US, then Denmark is the third number in variant detection. Then I think it comes Japan and so on. And in uh, red, uh, those are developed nations and in blue are developing nations. And the, the dotted line is the uh, median number of uh, isolates uh, required to detect one variant uh, other than the original variant. And you can see that most of the nations are below this number and that there is a very tight relationship uh, uh, where the number of variants detected uh, scales at the square root of the total number of uh, genomes sequenced. You can see the US and the UK on the top of the figure because those are the nations that have sequenced most uh, genomes and therefore detected most variants. But then you can see uh, Germany, Denmark, and so on. And if you look closely at this data, 
then uh, data points that tend to be uh, below the uh, figure are probably countries that are more thoroughly sequenced. And the ones above, like France, uh, Germany, Mexico, are countries where uh, detection is se sequencing limited. So based on this, we are, this is a paper that is, uh, uh, has been reviewed and we hope to uh, publish soon because the reviews were uh, positive. Then uh, we call for the establishment of a, a clearinghouse, a mechanism for global cooperation in sequencing of a, of a variant so that a, countries that have a limited capacity, like might be the case of Mexico and others, then uh, send samples to be sequenced in facilities in countries like the UK, USA or Denmark, which has obviously very large sequencing capabilities so that we all detect them before uh, they spread, which will be the only way by which we contain the global rise of new, more infecting variants. And uh, there's been already humans who have been found to be infected with one, more than one variant. Uh, and there's also a, a lot of cases where uh, vaccinated people are infected. Mm, the severity of the symptoms may differ, but that also, also uh, provides evidence that some variants are already escaping the immune immune defenses that uh, vaccination provides. So with this, I'd like to uh, end, and I don't know if I took too much time because uh, I don't have a clock with me, but I'll be happy to take questions if there is time to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Nice, nice talk, lots of information. Now the, okay, let's uh, everyone having questions or comments can just unmute the, the microphone and ask the question. Good morning, Carlos. This is Manuel. I have a question for you. Uh, you are, uh, at the beginning of the talk, you have been discussing, I mean, the mutation rates. Uh, uh, I mean, I guess that you are considering molecular mutations and then you take them into account to count the number of variants and so on. My question is that if you just work with, with, with basic molecular mutations, I don't know if you are taking into account that unless other RNA viruses like, for instance, the, the HIV of AIDS, uh, SARS-CoV-2, I mean, has a, a sample reading mechanism. So uh, has some error correction mechanism. So the basic, I mean, molecular mutations, I mean, does not yield, I mean, the, the total number of variants. So there's some diminishment, let's say, of the number of basic mutations. Yeah, uh, in fact, we, we are not using only uh, molecular mutations, but we are also calculating how many of them or the mutations are actually effective and eventually propagate in the community. So both accounting for correction, but also accounting for uh, mutations that are not eventually not viable and not infective. So I think uh, I don't have the manuscript in front of me, but I think it's maybe something like one in every thousand uh, mutations actually eventually propagate. All of the others are really corrected or either corrected or they lead to non-infective uh, or very weakly infective uh, variants. And also the RNA viruses have another mechanism by which if two if viruses from two different uh, uh, variants uh, are able to infect the same cell, they actually can exchange uh, very large fractions of the of the genome. So something that, uh, that I think that explains the very large, uh, you can see a lot of hybridization. If you look at the, at the phylogenetic tree, you can see the arisal, for instance, of the UK variant, but all, then you can see green in another, in another branch. And I think that that's not arise from uh, independent uh, identical mutations, but it probably arises from individuals that were infected by more than one variant. And then within their cells, they, a new hybrid has been produced. So I think some of that uh, data on the phylogenetic tree calls for a hybridization, at least of the most infective variants being actually very frequent. And I don't know by now, but uh, already when we were brainstorming about, about this paper, uh, must have been around February, March, there were already a lot of cases reported of humans that were infected by more than one variant. But still the, the sequencing effort has been relatively limited. 
So probably the prevalence of that process is greater than, uh, than we are aware of. Thank you, very nice work, very nice connection with the Tree of Life, previous work, thank you. More questions? I have at least one myself. Well, it's related to the one by to your answer, but I want it to be more clearly stated. You have been discussing the, the new the new variants that are appearing, but the, can you give some numbers or how, how many of them are disappearing every day or every month or every? So, what is the rate of of selection or disappearance of the those new things? Uh, well, in fact, I haven't looked at the rate of disappearance, and I don't know if there are any variants that were found at one point and are no longer found. So I haven't really looked at this. We actually been looking at the rate of production of new variants. As, as I mentioned, the uh, doubling time is about 130 days. But of course, there's probably variants. Uh, I will need to interrogate the data again to find uh, how many variants were found at one point and never, never seen again. But uh, I just haven't asked that question. Yes, I don't know. I cannot uh, tell you how many, what is the rate of loss and gain. But for the tree to be unbalanced, there needs to be a, a rate of loss. So there might be a lot of branches that eventually do not do not stop growing and do not lead to more to more variants. So there should be, uh, we probably might be able to calculate it even from the scaling of the tree how many branches are not viable and, and stop growing, but I haven't done that calculation. More questions, comments? If not, I, I, I continue, I, I have Yeah, there are also uh, two co-authors in the call, uh, at least one I see him on the screen. So if anybody would like to, uh, one of the co-authors would like to add something. You're welcome to take the floor and and uh, add your comments to the questions. I wanted to ask on the so you have this image of the of the real time evolutionary tree of the the COVID of the, of the virus. Is um, you have well you have uh, shown some data, but uh, so it's needed to, to start to to really understand what are, what are the the, the scaling properties of the tree doing, but but you find some some scaling of the size of the branches with the with the with the, with the unbalanced with the depth of the tree that indicates that many so several branches branch a lot and several branches don't branch at all. This is and this was seen in other in other branching process of, or biological branching process. Is there any correlation between the topology of this tree? So the branches that branch a lot are not the in the in the measure infectivity of the different variants. Yes, yes, uh, that's a very good question. And indeed, there is. And the branches that branch more are the more infective. And there's probably two processes. In fact, one of them is one that we had not considered when we were looking at the scaling of trees. And it is a uh, well, we had we were discussing a uh, processes of uh, horizontal gene transfer. But at this point, which was uh, about a decade ago or even more when we were working with Alejandro, there wasn't any data on that. But I think the rapid rise of uh, some branches, why they become really heavy and grow a lot is both by infectivity, but also hybridization be between uh, two particular variants that are highly inf infective each other, then leading to even more super infective uh, branches. So these, uh, Non, uh, non mutational process, which is the hybridization. I think it pl plays a very important role and explains the very, very rapid uh, evolution compared to just simple mutation that probably would have been slower and probably would have led to uh, more homogeneous branching uh, processes. In fact, uh, was well, something I didn't mention is that uh, there are emerging concepts, and I think that's something maybe that you uh, those in the call could uh, think about and make some contributions uh, because the number of variants that are probably hiding and continue to appear uh, is so large. Uh, it is very likely that there will be some that will challenge uh, our vaccines and uh, uh, immune defenses. And I think that those are probably there already. So it might be that you know some of these are both uh, bypassing the vaccines and immune defenses and also highly infective we will be back to square one. 
So we will never, uh, we will never uh, race, uh, win the race by trying to catch up with the virus. So the only way is to use brute force again and supercomputers. And then even though the number is huge, then generate uh, in silico experiments of possible uh, mutations and variants, and then challenge them in silico against vaccines, and then try to continue to develop vaccines that are universal. There was a, a maybe even a, I think in some in some areas a lot of laughing about uh, you know Spain and the CSIC had a vaccine program that has not delivered a, a vaccine a vaccine that has been authorized yet, and some people were thinking, oh Spain again getting late. I think we should welcome every effort to develop new vaccines because we're going to need them, but we need to do in silico experiments using uh, massive simulations to be able to anticipate future variants and have defenses against them. So that will be the only way else we are at risk of coming back to square one uh, after a lot of uh, happiness that we feel we're reaching the end of the pandemic. I think there are very unpleasant surprises hiding in Mexico, Brazil and India. I see one question by Ricardo Martinez. Hello. From Brazil, precisely from Brazil. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Thanks for, for the talk, uh, Carlos. I like it a lot. So my question is actually related to this last point and actually also inspired by this concern we have here in Brazil. So do you think is there a way of using available data to infer or at least estimate how many variants may be lacking, I don't know, something like hidden Markov models or, or things like that to, to try to fill those gaps or is it completely impossible? No, I think it's possible. It will require a very large computational power, but uh, I think we will be happy to uh, collaborate with any of you and give you access to our supercomputer, which uh, the availability of time is uh, is probably unparalleled to any supercomputer anywhere in the world, and then try to use new techniques. I can, uh, maybe after the call, I can share with Emilio for him to distribute a number of relatively recent papers that start to... Uh, speculate around those lines and those processes but i think that will ultimately be the best defense that we can have is to try uh, to to try to use what we've learned in terms of evolutionary processes to try to project them forward and anticipate new variants that uh, do not exist or haven't been detected yet and then challenge those in silico against vaccines okay. thank you Any other comment or question? If, if not, then I think it's, it's just uh, just one hour of talk and that uh, has been very nice. Next talk. Thank you, Carlos, for this. Thank, and you, thank you, everybody, for attending. Yeah, just and one last comment. Uh, one last comment. It might be of interest because I know that that's an, an area of interest in uh, complex systems. We just published a few weeks ago a paper on sentiment analysis uh, using uh, of, of conversations around COVID in social media using uh, 150 million tweets. Uh, the nice thing about this uh, paper is that it is, it is multilingual. So we're following conversations in Chinese, Spanish, Italian, Arabic, English, and French. So I will share it uh, with you in case any, somebody is interested in looking at that as well. Okay, good. So you if you send it to me, I can, anyone interested can ask me and, and about the, those papers and we can, we can share if, if, if Carlos okay. passes it. Okay. If there is no, no, okay. If there is no, there are no more questions. Then thank you again to everybody. And okay. See you in next, next talk. <laughs> okay. Bye. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.